Management of Severe Asthma Exacerbation and Recognition of Acute Respiratory Failure by Dr. Rubing Wong and Dr. Keenan Haver. Today I'll be talking about asthma exacerbation in patient treatment. The case is that of a 13-year-old boy with severe persistent asthma who is maintained on high-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist who is admitted to the pulmonary service for asthma exacerbation. He has a history of multiple emissions, including one ICU emission, but no intubations. He received several courses of oral steroids in a whole year. Prior to admission, he developed increased shortness of breath and coughing in the setting of an upper respiratory infection. In the emergency room, his lung exam was consistent with expiratory wheezing and decreased aeration. He was diagnosed with an asthma exacerbation. He received stacked beta-2 agonist and oral steroids in the emergency room, and while inpatient, he was receiving beta-2 agonist every two hours. The nurse pages you at this time as the patient is complaining of chest tightness after one hour of albuterol, and he seems to be in distress. The biggest challenge in asthma exacerbation is identifying the patient at risk for deterioration. Initiation of timely and appropriate treatment may prevent an adverse or even fatal outcome. The questions to ask on the phone are, what are the current vitals, and that includes respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, heart rate, and blood pressure. If not yet done, obtain the vitals and place the patient on a cardiopulmonary monitor. Go assess the patient immediately. When you are in the room, ensure the patient is connected to a cardiopulmonary monitor, ensure the presence of adequate personnel in the room, and ensure oxygen delivery sources nearby. Do not forget your ABCs. Assess the airway. Is the patient speaking or crying? Assess the breathing. How is the respiration rate and oxygen saturation level? How is the circulation? Assess the heart rate and perfusion. For physical exam, concentrate first on the general distress level. Is there accessory muscle use? Is the patient able to speak in full sentences? How is the mental status and the level of consciousness? How is the coloring of the patient? Is the patient cyanotic or pale? Chest exam, focus on increased work of breathing. Again, focus on accessory muscle use, retractions in younger patients, and nasal flaring in infants. Auscultation of the chest, please focus on wheezing, inspiratory to expiratory ratio, and air movement. Patient and classic asthma exacerbation usually will have diffuse polyphonic expiratory wheezing, increased expiratory phase, and diminished air movement. These findings may vary based on the limitation of airflow. The presence of silent chest can be a dire sign of an imminent cardiopulmonary failure. Also assess the presence of focal exams, such as absence of breath sounds on one side or the presence of focal crackles, which may indicate pneumothorax or pneumonia. For the cardiac exam, assess the heart rate, which may be increased due to bronchodilator use. The presence of bradycardia can be a sign of life-threatening disease. Assess for the presence of pulses paradoxes, which is a decrease in systolic blood pressure of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration, which can be a sign of severe exacerbation. Point of clarification. Determining the presence of pulses paradoxes may be difficult without an arterial line. However, you may have a suspicion for it based upon feeling a change in the pulse strength during palpation and or by seeing a variation in the amplitude on the pleth tracing on your saturation probe. Presence of rash or hives may alert the physician to the diagnosis of anaphylaxis. A brief history may be obtained while the patient is being examined. The priority is to identify quickly the patient at risk for adverse or fatal outcomes. Questions may include, when was the last dose of bronchodilator administered? Was there any instigating events, such as exposure to allergens or irritants, food, new fevers, rhinorrhea, or ill contacts? Remove possible offending agent if present. If the ingestion of food precedes the attack, one may consider the presence of anaphylaxis. Ask the patient for symptoms such as chest tightness, dyspnea, chest pain, dizziness, palpitation, or throat tightness. The presence of throat tightness may indicate a possible concurrent vocal cord impairment. Identify risk factors for death from asthma, such as asking about previous asthma attacks with respiratory failure, seizures, loss of consciousness, intubations, and ICU stays. The presence of poorly controlled asthma prior to admissions by asking the frequent beta agonist use, recent hospital admissions, or the use of many maintenance medications to achieve control. 
ask about poor self-perception of symptoms such as disease severity and the inability to sense critical or worsening bronchospasm. Ask about the history of underutilizations of medical resources, non-compliance, psychosocial economic problems. Labs and checks x-rays are usually not necessary in an emergent situation, but may be helpful to identify alternative or concurrent diagnosis and or monitor side effects of current medications. Labs such as an arterial blood gas or a venous blood gas may be considered to help guide severity and need for intubation. A chem tin may be checked as therapies may lead to electrolyte imbalance. For example, albuterol can lead to hypophosphatemia or hypokalemia. Unless an alternative diagnosis such as infections is raised, labs such as a CBC or blood cultures are not necessary and routinely checked. In general, labs seldom change management during an asthma exacerbation, especially in a younger patient where lab draw may actually cause more respiratory distress. Imaging such as chest films are unlikely to be helpful unless an alternative diagnosis such as pneumothorax, pneumonia, pneumomediastinum, and actylaxis are entertained. Indications for chest x-ray include focal exam findings such as crackles or decreased breath sounds, fever greater than 39 degrees Celsius, or severe respiratory distress. An EKG can be considered if severe tachycardia or electrolyte abnormalities are present. The goals of treatment include rapid reversal of airflow obstruction by bronchodilator and early institution of systemic glucocorticoid, correction of hypoxemia and severe hypercapnia if present, and correction of dehydration if present. Interventions include supplemental oxygen if hypoxemic and IV fluid if there's evidence of dehydration such as dry mucous membranes, poor perfusion, or severe tachycardia. First-line medications include bronchodilators, most commonly an inhaled short-acting selective beta-2 adrenergic agonists such as albuterol. Albuterol may be delivered as a nebulizer at a dose of 0.15 mg per kg, ranging from a minimum of 1.25 mg and a maximum of 5 mg per dose. It can also be administered as a meter dose inhaler with spacer at a dose of 2 to 8 puffs per dose. For moderate exacerbation, consider adding a beta-2 agonist combined with ipratropine bromide. Ipratropine bromide can be given as a dose of 250 mcgs per dose if less than 10 kilos or 500 mcgs per dose if greater than 10 kilos. Consider three back-to-back -back inhale beta agonist and hypertropium bromide combined nebulizer every 20 to 30 minutes. Point of clarification. Many institutions use an alternative strategy that combines the three doses of the beta agonist and ipratropium at once over 60 minutes. This is often referred to as a unineb and decreases potential for interrupted therapy. For patients with poor inspiratory flow or those who cannot cooperate with nebulizer MDI treatment, alternative first-line therapies may include epinephrine or terbutaline. First-line medication also include anti-inflammatory systemic glucocorticoid, usually in the form of prednisone or prednisolone, given at 1 to 2 mg per kg at a maximum of 60 mg. And for those who cannot tolerate oral intake, consider IV methylprednisone given at two, 1 to 2 mg per kg IV or dexamethasone at 0.6 mg per kg oral, IV, or IM. It is important to monitor response to therapy. Ongoing monitoring every 20 minutes for the first hour of therapy is required. This includes monitoring of respiratory rate, heart rate, oxygen saturation, degree of alertness, accessory muscle use, retractions, and chest oscillation. It is also important to monitor for medication side effects, such as tachycardia, hypotension, and signs of electrolyte imbalance. Failure to respond is indicated by poor air movement, worsening or persistent hypoxemia, fatigue, change in mental status, carbon dioxide retention. If there's failure to respond, it is important to step up to the next level of medical treatment. The indication for an ICU stat or code blue include failure to respond to bronchodilator or systemic steroids, needing albuterol more often than every two hours, severe hypoxia or needing high flow oxygen on the floor, and presence of hypercarbia, which indicate fatigue and imminent respiratory failure. Hemodynamic instability, severe electrolyte imbalance, asymmetric chest wall movement, tracheal deviation, and absence of breath sounds, which can all indicate the presence of a pneumothorax. If there's no significant response after three intermittent doses of bronchodilator, one can consider switching to continuous albuterol, given at 0.5 mg per kg per hour. Magnesium sulfate can also be given IV 
at a maximum of 2 grams over 20 minutes. Magnesium sulfate can be administered alongside with continuous albuterol. Point of clarification. Hypotension is a side effect of magnesium. Consider giving a bolus of normal saline with or before magnesium administration. There is no need to check magnesium levels prior to infusion of magnesium. If there's again failed response to continuous albuterol and IV magnesium therapy, systemic beta-2 agonists can be considered, such as terbutaline, which can be given at 10 mcgs per kick sub-Q. This may be repeated. Terbutaline can also be given an IV formulation of 10 mcgs per kick bolus over 10 minutes, followed by infusion. Epinephrine can also be given at 10 mcgs per kick if there's no evidence of anaphylaxis. This may be repeated. It is recommended that either tributylene or epinephrine is given, but not both. Point of clarification. Increased doses of tributylene greater than 4 mics per kilo per minute are associated with increased risk of side effects, including tachycardia, hypotension, and arrhythmias. Tributylene must be given in a monitored setting, such as the intensive care unit. If a patient develops hypotension while on terbutaline, increasing the infusion by 0.1 to 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute will help to overcome the beta-2 selectivity and improve the hypotension. There are insufficient data to support the routine administration of non-standard therapies, but in patients with life-threatening exacerbations who are not responding to conventional therapies, the following may be tried. Heliox, which is a mixture of helium and oxygen, Please note that the use of Heliox limits the maximum oxygen concentration delivered. One can also consider ketamine. Due to its bronchodilating properties, this is the drug of choice to provide sedation for anesthesia before intubating the asthmatic patient. Point of clarification. These medications must be given in a monitored setting such as the intensive care unit. Mechanical ventilation. When possible, intubation should be avoided given potential to aggravate bronchospasm, induce laryngospasm, increase barotrauma, and depress circulatory function, an association with high mortality rate. Indications for intubations include cardiac to respiratory arrest, severe hypoxia, and severe hypercapnia if present, exhaustion, or mental status changes. Thank you for watching this lecture on asthma respiratory failure. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.